Hi, it's Dr. Noel Williams, Optimal Health Associates, June 12, 2023. We're going to be talking about mitochondrial function and cancer cells. I haven't done a post in a while. I wanted to take a break, let COVID pass per se. And so let's start talking about things that are really interesting in science and health and how to change people's lives. I think it's really, really a great subject that we can affect outcomes in people and we can significantly help cancer patients do better with their treatments and perhaps even impact uh, the ability to, for cancer cells to survive. So very excited to talk about that. Uh, thank you, Kim, for getting me motivated to do this again. And a big shout out to congratulations since I'm in Oklahoma to the University of Oklahoma Sooner girls softball team that knocked it out of the park three in a row way to go girls and all that so mitochondria what are mitochondria well they're they're little cellular organs and so the big change in medicine for me is this i'm approaching my 30th year in practice is over the last several years to go from being proactive on a large scale in terms of trying to prevent disease to really focusing on advances in proactive interventions which comes down to cellular activity if we're focusing on cells we're going to make a huge impact on people if we're thinking organs we're already too late that's the big thing i i said i texted this to someone a oncologist recently probably wasn't perfect but i said reactivity is failure and proactivity is professionalism we need to not be reacting to patients illness we need to be able to figure out what it, is going on before and get it knocked out and prevent it before it even happens, especially if you're getting chemotherapy or something. I mean, that's just basic to me and that's how we saw it practice, but that seems to be revolutionary sometimes. But it all starts though, gets back to how the cell works and the cell has organs in it. Think of the cell now as your body and it has different things. So the heart of the cell is the mitochondria. It makes the energy packets. If it makes energy packets, the rest of the cell works. If it does not, the rest of the cell is gonna become dysfunctional. You have the brain in the cell, which is the nucleus, and then you have all different other little organelles that do, does stuff, which I'll talk about. But the thing is, we have to focus on the central part of the cell, which is the mitochondria. So mitochondrias make ATPs. They take, ATPs are energy packets. They're energy packets. If you have energy, you have ATPs. That is why you have energy. You're making ATP successfully in your body and it transfers from the mitochondria to the cell, to the nucleus, to the tissue, to the organ, to the body. So that's the concept. But what goes into mitochondrial function is oxygen in normal mitochondria, glucose, and something called NAD, nicotinamide, adenide, dinucleotide, which is just niacin broken down a whole bunch of steps. And those together take one glucose molecules as the oxygen, glucose, and niacin go through the mitochondria and turns it into 32 ATPs, a key concept. That's oxidative metabolism. We need oxygen to go with the niacin and the glucose. So when you're breathing oxygen in, you're breathing it in for the mitochondria. When you're expelling the carbon dioxide, that is the mitochondrial waste product. It's very important to know that. It's oxygen, glucose, niacin, energy. Almost all disease processes in some form or fashion are a mitochondrial injury. We're gonna talk on my next post, it, kind of a retrospective on COVID and what we know about long haul and what we know happened on a cellular level, which was a mitochondrial injury. But now we're gonna talk about cancer. So if you think first and foremost, in order to get cancer, you have to have a mitochondrial injury. Why? Because as the mitochondrial get dysfunctional, their ATP production goes down. And there's a variety of things that can cause that. Poor nutrition, toxins, infections, uh, those types of things make the mitochondria not work. And when it's not working, it doesn't make ATPs. And ATPs, the decrease affects the energy in the cell. And that leads to dysfunction at the nucleus and inappropriate aligning of DNA 
and the expression potentially of segments of DNA that are not good for us. Number two, the ability to cell divide in the nucleus to reproduce the DNA can go awry. The my meiosis, meiosis process can go kind of all bad. <laughs> and you can get genes that mismatch and get mutations you don't need, which then causes cell growth problems or abnormal growth, and it causes what we call dysplastic cells, which can then become cancerous cells. And again, it's a mitochondrial injury. But once you get cancer, this is the thing to know, and this is cancer cells are completely different. So they're completely different because they go from being oxidative metabolism oriented cells to fermentation type cells, meaning they don't need oxygen anymore. Through Glycolysis, they take sugar without oxygen and turn it into ATPs. Very straightforward. Otto Warburg, and it's called the Warburg effect, I think in 1922, wrote the first paper about this. There's several thousand papers on it. How come most people don't know about it? Because there hasn't been a solution to affect that. But there is now, uh, potentially. But you don't hear any big pharma company talking about it. Most oncologists, other than counseling people to not eat sugar, don't talk about it that much because there hasn't been an easy to apply solution. So that's the first thing to know. Cancer cells need sugar. They take one sugar molecule without oxygen with the niacin and they produce two ATPs. So much less than the 32 when you're using oxygen. However, it's much faster. So it gives them a survival advantage. Plus cancer cells don't like oxygen. And so, and they don't, they also have problems with getting oxygen in, so it's a survival advantage. So they make sugar into ATPs without oxygen. There's another thing to keep in mind. Cancer cells don't have the same enzymes we do. And so when you look at a cancer cell, one of the enzymes it doesn't have is catalase. And catalase is a really important enzyme because when you take in something called vitamin C, which we've all heard of. Uh, vitamin C gets into your cells, works in the mitochondria, works in the cytoplasm, and it then breaks down immediately into hydrogen peroxide. Catalase in our cells, our normal cells, immediately goes hydrogen peroxide to water instantaneously. So hydrogen peroxide is essentially a very useful but momentary substance in our systems. It has a role to play because we can process it out of the cell rapidly. That doesn't mean I need you drinking hydrogen peroxide. That's not the point. But there's an important role within the cell for hydrogen peroxide momentarily, and it's gone. What happens with cancer cells is they don't have the catalase enzyme. So you get a buildup of hydrogen peroxide with high doses of vitamin C. That hydrogen peroxide breaks down into superoxides, or kind of think of them as little grenades in the cell, which cause lots of damage and can kill the cell. And that's unique to cancer cells. That doesn't happen with normal cells in the human body. So when you start to combine these concepts, you can do some pretty amazing things potentially to help cancer cell death. And so if you can block the fermentation pathway with um, certain things, whether it is berberine or metformin or doxycycline or a Zithromax tablet or some combination therein to hit all the different pathways, that's gonna lower a cancer cell's ability to tolerate stress. You then, if you add vitamin C at a high dose IV, that can put the cell over the edge and kill the cancer cell. Also importantly, if it doesn't, but someone's on chemotherapy, one of the big study areas which there's tons of papers on, but it's still not being universally adopted in any way, shape, or form, at least in the United States, is these interventions can help the normal chemotherapy or radiotherapy work better or the immunotherapy work better. And I will eventually at another talk talk about that or discuss that. So the bottom line, this take home point today is, take home point one is the mitochondria matter the mitochondria and cancer cells and pretty much any dysfunctioning cell is the key. And so if we can either augment 
the mitochondria, we can get better results in terms of outcomes for patients across all diseases, but especially in cancer, and we'll talk more about that. But the second thing is there's some opportunity to kill cancer cells by interrupting the glycolysis pathway or anaerobic pathway for ATP production, and then add vitamin C to the process. And there's more wrinkles, and I'm gonna go over more stuff about cancer and the different types of cancer cells because there's something that's very important we're gonna to get to called cancer stem cells, which no one talks about because we've never had a solution for them until the last few years, but it's a partial solution, which is immunotherapies. So th there's no such thing as recurrence in cancer. It's persistence. We have not cured the cancer or killed the cancer cells. And so you have often some left and they're the cancer stem cells. So that is another thing we'll get to. But anyway, that's just an initial talk on starting to think about mitochondria and cancer. I will keep on going on the cancer subject. Uh, take care, best wishes, and nice to be back. Good night.